All right, Megan, we're here today with Nate Reich. 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 I, I, I just, just asked how to it. pronounce it, and I did it. I wanted to go Reich. It's Reich. Now you'll remember it, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So he is newly a professional athlete with ASICs. And, uh, you know, we always love when we're walking around someplace, and we, I, I think we were at the running event, and we bumped into Nate, and then we found out. Nate, like we were just talking casual, I think. I don't even think it was related to ASICs at the time. Uh, you might have been around ASICs people. but uh, And then we found out, hey, Nate's, Nate's actually an athlete and with a size 13 foot. Yeah, yes, yes. That definitely makes it hard sometimes to find shoes. <laughs> that's for sure. I mean, that's, that's a good reason to have a sponsor right there just so they'll make a, a decent 13, a size 13 shoe. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Spikes are few and far between. So I'm happy that they were able to, uh, to, to make a spike, uh, that actually fits my foot. Okay. So I know you come from a family of athletes. Just tell me what it was like growing up with a parents that are very talented. Yes. No, it's, uh, a lot of people think it was like a lot of pressure, but I never thought of it as, as a lot of pressure. Like, yes, do I want to be better than than them absolutely um but i thought it was so cool like i i grew up when when both of my parents were in college um my biological dad went to the olympics when i was one my mom won her national title when i was five uh so it was awesome to uh to really be in that environment both of my step parents also were professional athletes stepdad played uh in the college world series for usc roommates with with aaron boone who's now the yankees manager and then my stepmom was top wow. five at Olympic trials and high jump. So, so yeah, it was, <laughs> it was super fun. And, you know, I, I always knew my grandpa played in the NHL, but, you know, living in the U S for most of my life, I was like, Oh, like he, he just, you know, played, played hockey. It was a really solid player. And then I moved up to Canada and I was like, Oh my goodness. I didn't realize how famous my grandpa was played with Wayne Gretzky and Bobby Orr scored 10 points in oh, one wow. game, three goals in 24 seconds. And I was like, Oh, okay you're a very big deal everyone's like are you jimmy's grandson i'm like i am um so uh so yeah it's it's, it's funny how you know even as i got older i was still learning about my family um and uh see yeah, that's my crazy mom... Go ahead. i mean that, that's just i was gonna say that's nuts I'm, I'm cutting you off here sorry but the my grandfather did a lot of cool stuff <laughs> and he could have gone to the Olymp well he had the option to go to the olympics but back then you had to pay for it. <laughs> he was like, eh. um, but I'm like, I've accomplished nothing <laughs> in the sports world. So yeah, it's pretty amazing that you're able to, to continue those genes on to excellence. But yeah. No, it, it's been, it's been super fun. I always told everyone that, you know, I didn't know it wasn't normal to do wind sprints at 7am against your parents on the weekdays until I was in high school and I was like, or maybe junior high, but I was like, yeah, this is, this isn't normal. You guys don't just compete with your family against about everything. Like my brother, Max, who's 18 is a decathlete number two in Canada, number or number one in Canada, number two in the U S in, uh, wow. in under 20. And I mean, of course, you know, not a lot of good decathletes are in a good 1500, but of course he runs like a 408 at the end of his, uh, deck. So, um, so yeah, him and I are always, always challenging each other. So you're in Georgia right now, but you live in Canada, right? Uh, so I, I just split my time 50, 50. Um, so I'm a dual citizen. Um, my mom can be for, oh, that's what I was getting. Yeah. Uh, and my dad can be for the, for the U S and my mom basically, uh, from my injury when I got paralyzed in 2005, uh, my mom was that pivotal, person for me and so um as a thank you i wanted to run for canada and also my grandpa's pride for canada was always uh something that uh really caught my eye early on and so it was it was pretty clear for me that i was going to run for canada uh if i ever got the opportunity yeah now you said paralyzed there and yes yes i did uh, let's let's hear that because we haven't really talked about it. Yeah, let's let's hear 2005. Talk to us about what happened and how that affected your everyday life. Yeah, absolutely. So I was playing golf with a bunch of my friends, and I think I mean we were 10 years old. We were completely driving our parents crazy. It was we had a, a, a all star baseball tournament the following day, and uh, living in Arizona at the time. I mean, everybody in Arizona seems like they all love golf, and you know you can play golf or so. She thought there, and so. 
we went and uh, a couple of us went and played around and you know as anything that catastrophic or crazy that happens in your life it all starts off pretty normal um and by 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 around the sixth pole an older group of gentlemen asked us if they could play through they're honestly just trying to take care of us they said hey why don't you hit your balls and stand hundreds of yards left of the fairway uh under the tree um and i i remember them saying like 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 so you're out of the way in my head like so you can't hit us um and uh and the next thing i knew i heard like this really weird driver at the time it was the sq nike driver that it sounded like a tin trash can so i remember that sound and then i had this numb sensation come over me like i never had oh, before. wow it's that fast uh, mm-hmm. and so he ended up hitting a line drive 150 from 150 yards out just hit me in the back left part of the head um and right away my right arm jolted down i called my mom um, she thought I'm a pretty, I was a pretty dramatic kid and she might argue that I'm still a little bit dramatic. Um, and, uh, I was like, Hey, can you come and, can you come and pick me up? And she's like, really, you paid for a full round of golf. Like you did not get hit net by a golf ball. Like you're fine. I pitched my best all-star baseball game the previous night. And I had been complaining about how my arm was really sore. And that was really what I was complaining about at the time. Um, and then she came and picked me up. And as we got closer and closer to the hospital, I knew that, yeah, something was, not okay um but and then i could kind of start to see a panic in my mom which my mom you never see panic in, in her ever um we, and she asked when we got to the hospital like hey nate jump out and go into the emergency room i will meet you in there and i tried to get out and i was dragging my right leg and that at that point i became oh, no. fully paralyzed in the right leg of my body um and then we got back to my actual hospital room and i had a seizure um and i was shaking uncontrollably i thought i was talking i wasn't uh, and that was my oh crap moment. Like, all right, this isn't just uh, I'm going to the hospital for a couple of days and I'll and I'll and I'll get yeah. out. But I was super naive and I didn't know what paralyzed meant, which I think it, I was super lucky. My mom kept saying it's going to be a really hard road, but but you're going to be able to do it. And then for me, just the pivotal moment in my life. Uh, you know, I was in the hospital for almost a month, and at, on my exit interview, the doctor said, Nate, never walk without a limp. Because sports are not in your future, and you probably won't graduate high school. And anyone who knows me well, yes, uh me and my mom, I was sitting right there. Um, And anyone who knows me well. Like, why would you even tell somebody that? Yeah. 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 It's kind of funny that, that, that he would say that, but I'm such a fiery person. Um, So uh, for me, it was like, oh, okay. All right. Let's do this. Um, And so for me, it was a, he was a focal point. Um, And, and, you know, now I don't see him as a, a bad person. I'm, and, and I'm sure he saw a bunch of no, kids but it that just, day. It just seems weird to tell a, a child, a 10 year old. Yeah. The, I mean, you got so much growth left in you that, Hey, you're, you're limited or, you know, this isn't going to happen for you. Like, it's like the weirdest thing to tell a, tell a kid. Cause like, who, it seemed who, like it worked out. Okay. Yeah. For Nate. <laughs> Nate, Nate, but it could, you know, another kid could have just been like, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but so it, real quick though, like, when you're on the golf course, obviously you're with your friends and stuff. You get hit by the ball. Are the, is the gentleman that hit you with with the ball? Is he helping you get like help? Like what what's going on? Yeah, yeah. So he he hit me and then he uh, drove his cart over to me and uh, said like, "Do you want me to drive you to the uh, clubhouse?" I said, "Yeah, that would be great." I'm, I'm not, I had my mom come in, come pick me up, and honestly, he was a really really nice gentleman. He he had a grandson the same age as me, and so I'm, I can't even imagine what he felt yeah. like um, at that point. Um, and so I remember he visited me in the hospital once, um, but you know, I someone asked me the question recently, like, does he know the Paralympic success that you have have had? And I don't think he has. And I think it would be really cool at some uh, point to connect yeah, with him if he's that would be helpful. alive and <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. kind of let him know that this path, um, you know, that was meant to happen for some reason. And I mean, I really truly believe that, that everything happens for a reason. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm super lucky that I had a great support system at the time and, you know, didn't let me be lazy and like, man, you have to go after it. Yeah. Well, it was interesting when we met you and, uh, you know, as introduced as an A6 pro athlete. Yeah. I like, there's nothing there. I didn't notice a limp. I didn't notice any indication that you weren't, you know, regular uh, it sounds uh, i don't know what the term for it what, what would you call if you're a non-paralympic athlete just now uh, like a, so i'm gonna a, say able-bodied normal i mean i don't 
I mean, All right. I mean, I'm I'm a straight the, shooter, so the, just, just just shoot it. <laughs> yeah, there's no indication of anything that that would keep you from being like I didn't see anything that would you know make me think oh there's a Paralympian that I'm meeting. Uh, is that normal? Like the normal response you get from people? Yeah, yeah. Normally, uh, for for sure, and for a long time, like that was the reason why I kind of didn't have any sponsorship opportunities or anything because I I really couldn't explain the di- the difference and no one could really see it in me um you know and then i think when mental health came around it was very easy to be like i have a hole in my head it's an invisible disability it's very similar to mental health um and you know some of the stuff that uh i've gotten really good at hiding it um too so um that was something for a long time i was ashamed sounds dramatic and too serious but um i definitely wanted to fit in um and so that's why I never went to the Paralympics until 2018. My mom kept trying to get me to, and I was like, nope, because um, I ran D1 track. So I was trying my best to, you know, make it on the Olympic stream. And there definitely came a point where I was a pretty mediocre college runner, like was all conference in a very small, in a very small conference, like ran in the low 350s, like nothing crazy. Um, and so I think uh, then I kind of knew I needed to make that transition. Well, I'm going to guess there's more people who are hurt like me who haven't really paid that much attention. Like I thought maybe when they told me you're on Paralympic, I was like, oh, maybe he has a prosthetic leg or something that I didn't see. Um, can you ex- maybe tell us a little bit about the games themselves, who participates in it and what, what the categories are? Yes, I was I was exactly like you. I I thought it was blind athletes and, uh, and amputees and that was it so they have a coordination impairment classification uh vision impaired um they have uh amputees they have uh intellectual disabilities um short 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 stature and i'm sure i'm missing i i I always miss out on one there's Uh, a i think there was a french one that there's in being from canada you should probably know how to speak french but um (laughs) they uh i think there's one last category that's like kind of like a coverall like anything that doesn't fit into those other categories um, was what we looked up, but yeah. So is it, uh, you have to explain that to people a lot, don't you? As yes. As, yes, I do. And like, especially in my classification, there's such a variety. There's like, I'm T38, which is technically the most function. Um, and so it's the, the highest category in the coordination impairment classification. Um, and so it goes from T34 to, to T38 and they combine 37 and 38, I think mostly for numbers, there isn't a huge difference between 37 and 38, but there is a competitive advantage for being a 38 um, for sure. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's definitely a lot of explaining around that. Um, and then obviously there's world records for each classification. And there's, you know, it, it, the interesting thing is that, you know, the Olympics, there's one champion for each event. And in para, there's multiple. Um, uh, and so, um, and so, yeah, it's super interesting, especially wheelchair is one of the biggest, um classifications especially you know in the longer distances and in the marathons it's pretty pretty lucrative too if you compare it to the other ones um and so um and so yeah it's it's super interesting and i think my my favorite thing is always to sit at the cafeteria and just hear 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 people's stories Uh, and i started a podcast during the pandemic um and so and it's just an excuse to just talk to people that i (laughs) some of them I, i knew really well and some of them i didn't know really well and just wanted to know and so I think that's the really cool it's, thing about my experience. It's really funny how a microphone It's I kind of felt like I, I used to like carrying a camera around because I felt like it was like a shield between me and other people sometimes. And <clears throat> same thing with a microphone. It's funny how it opens up. Like if you have one, you could walk up to anybody and talk to them. <laughs> hey, you know what's, what's your story? Whereas if you didn't have one or an excuse like, hey, I'm doing a podcast that there's it's it's much harder to kind of break those walls down between people no absolutely and i it, it even like some of my close friends some of my teammates i didn't know things about them until after i after we did the mm-hmm. podcast i was like oh i didn't know that you live on on the buffalo farm i'm like i i had i had, I had, I had no <laughs> idea um and so yeah it was it yeah it, it, it was an excuse for me and i've always been super embarrassed by uh my stutter as well and so, uh, that, you know, that was a fear of mine that I was like, all right, why don't I just attack this? And, you know, it could blow up in my face and I could stutter and stammer all the way through these interviews, but, or I could actually learn how to, uh, talk better and also have better conversations. 
That's I did you notice a stutter? No, but I, that's <laughs> that's amazing that you're like tackling all of like your fears head on. Like uh, so I really want to go back to 10-year-old Nate for a second. You come out of the hospital that you've been in for a month. The doctor tells you your sports are done, you're going to walk with a limp for the rest of your life. Like what happens next? Yeah, so um my mom my parents moved while we were we were in the hospital. Um, and my room ended up being upstairs. And I remember my mom being super concerned, being like, okay, we just bought this new house. Nate might not be able to walk again. And his room is upstairs. And uh, oh, one thing I love about my mom is that she always looks at, or looks at success and she really doesn't push you more than you need to be pushed. But she really asks really pivotal questions on how you want to be pushed. And so I told her my goals, I remember right after getting out of the hospital, I think we got out super late on a Saturday and I went to school on Monday. And I remember my mom looking at me and goes, I don't care if you have a migraine. I don't care what it is. Do not come home uh, early from school. You need to figure this out because your goals are very big and very ambitious. And if you want to accomplish those things, go after it. And so I ended up uh, doing running club uh, when I was in sixth grade. Um, definitely did not enjoy it at first. All right. So you were talking a little bit about cross country. And your success there coming in second place and being up against some people that weren't regionally against you. Is that where we were, where we were saying that you were getting into a little more exposure of, of uh, like a deeper field of talent? Yeah. So, yeah. So basically at regionals, you know, there's, I think there's like 15 regions in Georgia and I got second. And so obviously there's no reason to put me um, second place at state. Um, and the guy who I beat ended up finishing like 30th at state or something. So it oh, wow. wasn't like it, it was really great performance. Um, and I, I, I just think, you know, uh, I, I worked really hard during that year. And so, uh, I'm just really happy that this, that the success lined up because I mean, some of us, you can run a hundred miles a week, but it doesn't mean you're going to run fast. Um, and so I think yeah. that that really taught me that there should be some intention behind, behind what you're doing. And, um, that, that was something that I think has been a theme throughout my career is that I'm, I don't, I, I don't run the most miles, but I feel like I, I tick all of those, all of those little boxes. The work. Yeah. Um, so this is interesting because the, you're in, in the States now and in Georgia and you're running against it. This isn't Paralympics. This is regular, like what mainstream athletics, right? Yes. And correct. so you're seeing success against, uh, People was, was when, when did it start like shifting that you were like, when did you find out about Paralympics and that you were able to maybe participate in a different way? Yeah. So really it wasn't until, till, till 2018. I mean, I, I had finished college. I was super disappointed with the way my college experience yeah. went. I was like, I remember going into college, like my biological dad was NCAA record holder and um, and one NCAAs in the javelin. And so I was like, oh, I'm for sure going to the national meet my, my first year. And I think by the last year, I'll be, I'll, I'll be top three for sure. Like there's, there's no doubt in my mind no doubt. and I never qualified. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Like clearly no doubt. Um, and, and I didn't qualify for the national meet and track once, um, never went to regionals. Um, and so I think, you know, I was very happy that I had that success now that I look back. But I just had a kind of a bad taste in my mouth, and I felt like I, there was more from this sport that I wanted to get out. I wasn't too sure if it was on the running side. Um, I felt like running in some way sounds cliche, but kind of saved my life um, because if I didn't have that running running practice to go to every day, uh, who knows what I what I would have gotten into. Um, and then I remember my mom being like, "Hey, there's the parent the." The, the Paralympics that you've always said no to, uh, it's really growing now. Oh, so they uh, reached out to you before? Uh, no, my mom had just mentioned it. I guess she had always known oh. about it. Um, and just I was always like, no, no, stop. Yeah. Stop asking me about this. Um, and because uh, I, I was just so committed to the Olympic dream. And I, uh, in high school, I mean, I was like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm decent. So I, I think there's an opportunity. Um, and then, yeah, I got classified in 2018 and then I, uh, went to my first international competition in, Ber in Berlin, Germany, and I set the world record in the 800 and the 1500. And then I felt okay. like the lights got super bright and all of a sudden people, uh, we went straight to nationals from there. 
And all of a sudden, everyone wanted to interview me. And uh, like we said, like I was a mediocre athlete, like at best mediocre athlete in college. Uh, I never got interviewed. Uh, and now they're obviously they want to hear my story, but they want to talk about my running, which was very interesting for me because everyone always just wanted to talk my, about about my about my brain injury, not actually about my training and yeah. about my running. So that was. Yeah, it was, I remember I was so nervous for all, all, all these interviews and I was like, what, what is my life going to be now? The interesting thing is that, you know, one of the slogans for ASICs is sound mind, sound body. And obviously you kind of have both there now. So you kind of embody their, uh, their slogan. How did, how did it fit in? How did ASICs and you come together and how did that relationship start happening? Yeah, it's actually kind of funny. Um, so Ben Caesar has known my biological dad for about 20 years. Um, so oh, wow. he, when he coached at UC Irvine, um, my dad coached a couple of his athletes in high school and ended up going to him as as an athlete. And also my stepmom, uh, Lisa, is, is Filipino. Um, and they went on a trip to the Philippines. And I think my stepmom still has the high jump record for them. Um, and so... Oh, wow. Uh, and so, yeah, there was like this very intertwining connection. And then, uh, Melissa Bishop, who's 800 meter, uh, Canadian record holder is actually the one who made the connection, um, and said, you know, uh, I really think Nate would be a great person for, for, for the ASICS brand. And I think, uh, me and Ben had a, had, had a couple conversations. And I think the first conversation, it really seemed like it, is Nate really the person that Bish said I was. And then the second part was, hey, Nate, we don't make spikes in 13. Um, at least at that time, they, they didn't. So let me see if we can get spikes made. Because if I can't get spikes made in 13, <laughs> then obviously that's a problem. <laughs> um, and yeah. so, yeah, I was so excited. Because honestly, like there's this picture of me when I was three, I think it was. And uh, my dad had just gotten his box from Nike. Um, and just me trying on all, on all the stuff. And for some reason, that had been like, it was like win gold get sponsored like it it, it had yeah. always been i'd always been get so stoked to get all, yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely and so i've always been such a nerd on that side as well um so it was really cool when i got that first big box and i was like this is so awesome uh, and and of course every male in my family were a size 13 of course so i feel like the whole family is very excited about <laughs> right, that right, i'm right, getting right, right. hand over those <laughs> nova blast fours the um yes, yeah absolutely. it's really interesting because uh, look, Ben is somebody that I, since I met, he's just got a charisma about him that uh, he, you just want to be around him. You want to know what he's up to. You want to, I've tried to get him on the podcast. He will not come on the podcast. <laughs> I know he has stories. Um, but yeah, so it's got to be fun. I mean, working with Ben and coming into the team and you've got other athletes like Val and Emma, like what's it like coming on to the, um, a6 team and, and meeting the other athletes have you had a chance to kind of like be all in the same space yeah so not not a bunch of the athletes um the coolest one for me was was, was meeting cam in austin when i met when i met both of you um they did an interview with me like three or four days after i had signed uh, kane running did a interview with me and i had mentioned how cam levens was the person that i would absolutely love to meet um, <laughs> and it was funny that i had no idea that cam was going but all of a sudden i met him in the lobby and i was like oh holy crap and cam's like well i know you i was like well i certainly know who you are um yeah. and so it was really fun like that whole night we just got to chat and it uh, uh for me that was i mean i'm not someone who's super starstruck just because of my family but also my uncle works in the nba and so i've met blake griffin um been around Shaq and around steve nash so those are you know i don't necessarily get starstruck but it was just really cool to hear his you know obviously he runs a lot more than i do um and also just hear his mindset when it comes to running because i mean you know he's his marathon career hasn't been linear for sure um but and it's really cool to just hear uh you know he just saw those little glimpses of of success which kind of kept him going and so just to kind of share those moments it's kind of like those chats in the dining hall for me uh you know just uh, being able to share our our experiences so it was pretty cool and then every time someone some someone would come over oh are you cam levens <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was just laughing i was like yep i'm sure that's reaction you get all the time <laughs> yeah, you're, waiting, you're waiting for it are you <laughs> um, the um like, the great thing about that is, is you are able to share those like you said nuggets that are at a, a certain level 
and you know you have a trust because you know the person's gone through a similar experience as you training and and working towards a goal so what was the thing that you took away from him that that you're using now i think i think his mindset with success and failure i think he doesn't really put too much like hey like, let's learn from the failure but like he doesn't really take it to heart and sometimes uh, i do that a little bit too much uh, and i'm coming off a year where i was very disappointed with my year other than worlds um, I didn't run well. I think I, um, 2022, I kind of got away with, um, you know, probably drinking a little bit more than I probably should have and just enjoying life a little bit more because I was so focused in, in, in 2021. I didn't see my family for almost two years. I just literally, mm-hmm. like locked myself in, in, in Victoria and just trained my butt off. And so I think I was <laughs> in my, trying to find that balance. Like I, I never drank till I was, 23 and I didn't really have the college experience uh, just training and so I think I was just trying to <laughs> find this kind of happy medium trying to see uh, if it was in there for you yeah and so it was really cool to kind of hear kind of his experience and um and so yeah I really took that away and I think I the stuff that socially podcast or events really fills my cup up and uh I think Cam and I are certainly different uh, when it comes to that, um, but just really finding what fills your cup up, and that was something that you know he was mentioning to me. I, I think that's an interesting concept because we do we obviously we go to events, and we sometimes are working during the events, or or I call it work. It's not really work. I I really enjoy what we do, but it is interacting with people, and it either like you said fills your cup up or takes energy from you. And I noticed that there are some athletes that they do like going out and seeing and hearing your name and stuff like that really gets them pumped up. And there's other people that like are in the hotel room and want (laughs) nothing to do with people until after, after the event. Um, With you saying that you enjoy the podcast and that kind of stuff is like, do you think that socializing and just kind of that relaxed energy from other people is something that you before an event you like, or are you the kind that likes to shut things down and uh, like hibernate until the race? Yeah, it matters what it matters what race it is. Uh, Paralympics, I'm definitely more of the hibernation uh, one. Uh, I had never felt nerves like I did in Tokyo. Like I, I thought like worlds. I was dancing before the starting line, um, and then I got to the Paralympics, and I was like holy crap like i feel like i can't even i feel like i'm jogging like eight minute mile pace and my heart rate is like 190 like i don't i have no idea what's going on and and my legs stopped working before the race and i was freaking out and so i had never felt that (laughs) that way before Wait, are you talking about tokyo 2020 yep Mm -hmm. okay because i wanted to talk about that whole experience (laughs) so let's go back there for a minute because i also didn't realize that you didn't get into the paralympics until 2018 and then all of a sudden you're in tokyo like so you just went straight for it real fast yeah yes 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 no certainly did Um, Um, so yeah so talk to us about i mean luckily he had been running before that yeah but (laughs) talk to us about that whole experience because i know 2020 tokyo was also like a a little weird in itself but yeah so just tell us all about it yes absolutely so one quick story is that you know growing up my mom used to always kind of mess with me and what i mean by mess with me like she would be like all right nate let's do a time trial on friday and on thursday we end up having a time trial we get the friday she's like all right good luck or she would like put one of my shoes somewhere where i couldn't find it and i would freak out and then I would find it or she would talk to me a Your lot. Mom and sounds a little psycho. <laughs> she's awesome. <laughs> um, and then she would like talk to me a lot in the car. And I, I do not do not talk. I don't like being talked to like right before my race. Like it drives me crazy. And she would just ask me the same question over. I'm like, I'm literally going to yell right now. Um, and so um, in that moment uh, when I was warming up for my race, I was freaking out. Like I was losing it. Um, and so I, and then I thought back of like, okay, my mom always used to do this stuff to me all the time. Like, I know I'm going to be fine when I step on that starting line, but yes, I feel horrible right now. Um, and so, um, I'm, I was super thankful for that. Um, and my Tokyo experience did not live up to what I thought my experience would be. 
Um, you know, I have my cousin, George M. Moline, was an Olympian. My dad went to the Olympics. Uh, many other people in my family didn't. So I had this, this thought process on what it would look like based on their experiences. And it wasn't like that at all. Like, didn't go to opening or closing ceremony ceremonies didn't leave the stadium or didn't leave the facility uh, the village only for practice um so i didn't get to do any of that stuff uh the cafeteria was still open but you only could sit with your country you couldn't talk to anyone um and i didn't realize how nervous it would make me like i was sitting diagonal from my biggest competitor and that's super weird like six days before the race, you're getting nervous for the race because you see the guy from Ireland who's destroyed everyone in your classification forever. Um, so I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm super nervous about that. Um, then three days before the race, I had a, kind of another freak out. Like, what if I fail? What if I lose? Like kind of feeling this pressure, what people talk about. And I, like I said before, I'd never felt that pressure. And so it was interesting that it came three days before in that wave. And I kind of had to change my mindset being like, all right, I'm going to make, make that 10 year old paralyzed kid proud. Like how cool would he think that he has the opportunity to win gold? Who cares if it doesn't happen? Obviously I want it to happen. Um, but, um, just, you know, focus on something that you can actually control. And I was really surprised with how much pressure that took off my shoulders by actually just focusing solely on that. That's interesting. Now, when you talk about the experience that you were expecting from the Olympics, like we hear, like uh, nobody from my family's ever gone, so I don't have any expectations. <laughs> but I'm I'm thinking about like you the you hear the stuff about all the nations getting together, the wild parties, the socializing, and just the opportunities to be around world class athletes having fun. Is was that kind of like what you were hoping that you would get? Uh, yeah, from experience or were, was there something else? Yes, that and the distractions. Like everyone everyone talks about the distractions and i was like there was not one distraction maybe i was like <laughs> part of me is like well, the man, Irish guy. I, man i'm just really good like i'm just i'm just really good really good at focusing which i don't think yeah. that's 100 percent the truth so um that's why i'm super interested for paris um to see yeah. what those distractions are and even like two weeks ago a couple of my teammates who had been to multiple games were talking about dude this the 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 distractions are crazy i was like really like I, I, I still don't like, I'm not really like, I'm not going to go to a party before my race. Like that's just, that's just not going to happen. Um, Is so that yeah, they're saying there's like stuff that like you want to do, like you feel like you'll have FOMO. It's your one chance to go to the Olympics. There's events going on, you know, you, you don't want to miss anything. Is that the distraction? Yes. That and family. Um, cause they talk yeah. about like that's, Athletics Canada specifically is very concerned about, about the family aspect because they're going to call this the, the celebration games. And in the past, like athletes would have to kind of deal with tickets and like hotels and try to make the family happy. And we have like multiple people now with Athletics Canada that solely deal with that, which is awesome. Like they put packages together and all that stuff. So um, I think that was, that was another thing, which my family is so important to me. So but at the same time, like they're all athletes, so they all understand, like that they're not going to be talking to me or like hanging out with me the night before the race. Like that's probably not going to happen. Um, so, um, it, but I never thought family being a distraction. Yeah, that, that, that was kind of interesting and weird for me to hear that. Yeah. Okay, so your nerves calm down by the time you get to the start line. Talk to us about the race itself. Yeah, no. So of course we do all this heat training. Like, oh yeah, so much heat training. Sauna, you know, up in <laughs> Fox up Arizona during you know July, um, absolutely sweating like crazy. And then all of a sudden we get out to the track and it's raining. I'm like, ah, of course, of course, just like a <laughs> Thursday in Victoria, British Columbia. Um, so I, I I remember getting a big chuckle about that. And a lot of my competitors were mm -hmm. were were complaining about the rain. And my coach and I made a certain effort that no matter what the weather was, I trained outside. Um, and so I'm really happy that we did a lot of really hard, long threshold or VO2 workouts in the rain. Um, and so uh, my plan was to see what everyone did the first 400. And we ran 64 seconds. And the French guy took it out super hard. Um, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is like. Perfect, because I'm the one who usually goes out hard because I'm not comfortable with going out hard, but that's my best scenario to actually win the race. 
Um, and so after 400 meters, I was like, okay, me and my coach talked about going with, six, with 600 meters left. And I just completely threw that race plan out the window. Um, and I was like, all right, <laughs> I'm going to run that same exact pace and see what happens. And so I ran another 64 and I remember looking back after engine mirrors and I was like, Oh my gosh, there is no one here. This is crazy. Oh, and wow. I was like, kind of internally freaking out being like, okay, yeah. keep it calm, keep it calm. And then I just, from after 800 out, I tried to just lay the hammer down. I was like, all right, let's go. And then with 200 mirrors to go, I kind of knew, kind of knew I was going to win. Um, wow. And so I was like, all right, keep it composed and keep it composed. And then with, 15 years ago, like, Nate, don't scream over the line. Like, just run over the line. Like, be a good competitor. Shake everyone's hand. No, I'm screaming after I finish. Like, just <laughs> yelling. Of course, my buddies get memes of me. And I thought I was going to get a bunch of congrats from all my boys when I get to my phone. No, it's all memes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> See, that's there was somebody who just did a comedy skit about that. They're like, uh, if... A, a woman does something all her friends are like oh you know that's the greatest and they're just so supportive you know guys do it and they like make fun of you for you know like, <laughs> oh 100 percent who are coming they come over yeah <laughs> but i think that is a form of love it's like you can't say to your, your uh man you're you're the best and uh you're better than me <laughs> you got you got to come up with a way to bring him back down to earth oh absolutely and one funny thing about preparation as as we were talking about earlier we had a workout about eight days before the race and my coach J jeff harris was an olympian in the 800 uh, around like 145 i think it was um and so he does a lot of my training with me um and uh and we did like this hard k um and he was supposed to be my competitor and he made this stupid in my eyes move where he went out hard from the gun and ran like a 62 first lap and I was like, no one's going to do that. Why would you even think about doing that? And of course, literally the happens. exact same yeah. thing happens. And I was like having deja vu with like after 200 mirrors. I was like, oh my gosh, like, how did they know this is going to happen? The coach is like, we didn't know, but um, yeah. And so that's funny that yeah, sometimes that's amazing. it works out perfect. <laughs> so you you what does the Paralympics mean to you, especially since like, like what would you be doing if you weren't competing in Paralympics now, like it, it's gotta be an incredible opportunity, but like, have you imagined what life would be like without it? Yes, I have <laughs> imagined. And I know, I mean, I'm really interested in uh, sports medicine. My family has been in, in sports medicine for a lo really long time. So I kind of went down that avenue a little bit, trying to see if I would like it. Um, and I don't think I, I think I like it, but I don't know if I love it. Um, and so I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. And the business world is always, um, interests me sales specifically. Um, and so now that's kind of something that I'm trying to go down and just check out one of my sponsors, RBC, um, it, it is Royal Bank of Canada, biggest bank in Canada. And so there's some opportunities to do there. I'm, I'm looking to do, but I would have no idea what my life would look like. I mean, I would have never probably traveled the, the, the way I have and, and the Paralympics means so much to me. I mean, there's there's this debate like if a Paralympian gets called an Olympian, th does that bother you? For some reason, there's been like this uh, conversation within the Paralympic community with this, and for me, it doesn't bother me. Uh, I, I have great Wait. respect. What's it? What is the question? Whether you would be bothered to be called an Olympian or? Mm -hmm. Yes, because I think uh, I didn't know you're an Olympian, right? I mean, you ran, yeah, in the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So a lot, a lot of people like I am super proud to be called a Paralympian. So if someone would ask me like, what would I be, be preferred than Paral Paralympian? Because that's what I did. But also like it doesn't bother me. Like, I have so much respect for Olympians, and so I think you know, there's I think in today's climate, there's so much you know, you have to pick the perfect word to say. And I'm definitely that's yeah. definitely not who I am. Um, you know, I'm someone who likes to tease around, who likes to give someone a hard time. And also like, I'm, yeah, if you call me Olympian, that's great. I think that's great. Um, and I mean, I guess the, the thing that I, that would be, I could see the only thing that would be, um, like a, 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 a issue would be if someone says, all right, oh, you're an Olympian, you might want to add in, yeah, I run Paralympics or whatever. So there's a clarifier, but I mean, yeah, I mean, do, do people walk around calling you an Olympian all the time? <laughs> like, like in your normal life? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> so yeah, it was. So yeah, it's been. It, it's funny when people. I mean, their opinion is their opinion. I think that's great. Uh, but it's funny how some people have some pretty hard, thick opinions um, on those things. And um, you know, I like podiatrists I, I kinda, not really being doctors. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Our so. dentist doctors. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. You, you, you yeah, get in the, trouble real quick there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. PhD versus, you know. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. Okay. Yeah. So you kind of lit up when you were talking about the race in Tokyo. Would you say that is your, like, happiest, most proud race moment? Or is there something else? Uh, you'd be surprised to hear. No, it's actually not my my favorite race or the one that uh, I'm most proud of. It's when I ran 3:47 and ran the world record because I had been stuck at 3:52 for four years, and I was like, "All right, I don't know if I'll ever break 3:50." Like I'm in, like aerobically, I'm in crazy shape. Um, my threshold was getting down to 5:15 miles, and I was like, "And a lot of people who have runs up 3:50, that's kind of where their threshold is." And I understand like you can't really compare yourself, but like I'm like. At some point, this has to break. Um, and early in the year, I ran 350, um, and I ran like a total ding dong. Like I hit the gas at 500, and I hit all of the gas, like 100 percent zero to 100. And I, I was like, oh my, I was like, I think I ran like almost 20 seconds for the last hundred meters. Like it was brutal. Um, and oh. so I met with my physiologist and my coach, and was like, hey, like, all right, I need to run sub 350. And I'm going to run sub 350, but we need to change a lot of this. And I'm not someone who runs even. I'm a bit sporadic when it comes to my racing. And so I ran 61.1 laps all the way around the track and ran 347.8. Um, and I remember just being so proud because I I, I was in Chula Vista for eight weeks. And I didn't, I, I mean, we didn't leave the facility. It was literally every day was focused on running. And I think when you really put in that work, it's just something special. And, and I also, there was that doubt. I didn't think I would ever get there. And I felt like crap before the race. Um, and so just to see like, I'm like, Hey, if I felt like crap and I accomplished that, like, I think I can run faster. And so I think that's, that's really what keeps me coming back. And it's like, I haven't run that fast since that race. So, um, I'm really motivated this year. We have a race set up on May 29th and, uh, hopefully it'll be in, in Guelph, Ontario, uh, to go after the world, the world record. And we're trying to get some hype around it. I feel like I need some more pressure to be put around it because in Tokyo, I did not handle the pressure how I wanted to. And so we're going to call the shot and trying to also, build it up. Yeah. And build it up. And so, um, and I'm hoping to make it a fun event too. hopefully get a lot of fans out, you know, and, uh, I'm going to do a couple interviews before just like kind of explaining my thought process yeah. and really, uh, doing a lot of Q, uh, Q&A just to, yeah, I mean, a lot of people seem to be interested in the mindset when it comes to a race like that. And so I'm super excited to kind of share that. I love to hear that you're sporadic uh, because like as is, as a lay person <laughs> just doing repeats, I'm all over the place. <laughs> so it's like, I can't figure out paces, but um, yeah. It, so do you have, are you a metal person? Like, do you like having the visual like you can see your accomplishments or do you like uh, on to the next? Yeah, no, I don't put any of them out. Um, half of the time, I feel like my mom, she used to work at the high school. And so she would always bring my medal to school. I'm like, where's my medal? I have no idea where my parent look gold medal is. She's wearing it around. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I always thought, I always had the train of thought of like, I want to act like I've never won anything. I want to stay motivated in that way um we do have like some shadow boxes that are not in my room they're like tucked away in the basement um and so we do we have done some cool things with them but i i just don't put them up yet i think i think there will come a time where i will but not now yeah that's what i was gonna say maybe it's maybe when you feel like you are finished with this chapter yeah you want to go back and have the memories around yank yeah out. absolutely Absolutely. And it, it does feel weird too. When someone calls me a Paralympic champion, that's, it still sounds so weird to me. Like, I don't really know how to act in that sense. Like, like, yeah, like, like when people ask me, like sometimes I'm shy about it and don't really 
like talk about it that much because I don't want to be like, oh, like look at me, like I won the Paralympics, yeah. and then my mom's always like, did you know my son, you know, won the Paralympics? Yeah. Like, oh, That's how your mom oh. introduced you. <laughs> this is my champion, such a typical champion mom. Nate over here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, a lot of times we'll count. Uh, like if we go out for dinner or like if it's a social event, me and my brother Max and my sister Avery will count how, how, how many times she, she uh, manages it throughout the night. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of, we just like to give her a hard time. So, But I'll tell you as a parent, I can't imagine anything that would be better than to have your kid go after goals and achieve them. Like there's, there's something that, like it's, it's an extension of them. Like, Hey, look, I raised this kid and I, I know from having my own kids, you kind of come out with your own personality. It's not like we plant a seed and you're just a little <laughs> second, you know, version of us, but to see that the things that she did as a parent maybe helped you get to this level where you're at, which is like a world champion. Like that's pretty sick. Like as a parent, I'd be like, my job's done. I'd be <laughs> proud of it too. I'd be dropping it everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, she certainly does. I think I think she she remembers how I was in the hospital and just after I I got out. And I think sometimes it makes her laugh. Like, wow, I can't believe that he got from that to you know there. Uh, and so I think yeah. it's kind of funny for her. There, it sounds like your parents are also pretty young. Like uh, they they had you when they were in college. Mm -hmm. So yes, do, my mom's you, fifty. You, so yeah, young. Okay. Yeah. Do you are you able to still like? turkey trot go for runs on thanksgiving that kind of stuff or you don't do thanksgiving up in canada what what what's the holiday that you shoot you guys would do a, a running event up in canada yeah so uh yeah we don't do any no one runs with me anymore um you know, oh, my, no. my brother max will a little bit i mean he's he's super quick though so like i have to be very careful with the distance he, he runs like 47 seconds in the 400 so i don't want any part of that um yeah, it's so, at least three miles right yeah i was like especially a mile i was like i'll just take you out so hard that you have no idea what to do with yourself so um but uh <laughs> we have we have a lot of cornhole competitions so we do like for oh. for, for thanksgiving we do the olympics so we have like an axe throwing we have cornhole we have a chipping competition and so everyone always laughs at us like axe of throw? course oh yeah Axe throw against a tree. Yeah, yeah come are on. Are you looking to target? add more people to the Paralympics? <laughs> <laughs> Just more people with a beat. Come on, no, no I'm joking. Um, yeah. But uh, so yeah, anything we can compete against, it's it's game, game, yeah. game on for sure. Yeah, your family sounds very competitive. I love it. Yes, everyone always teases us. Like, of course, you guys have an Olympics for. For, uh -huh. for Thanksgiving, you guys just can't go and relax. I'm like, no, of course, we got to have something to do. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, I know we're getting close to the hour mark here, but we have to chat a little bit about shoes. So tell us what's your favorite daily well, trainer? I mean, first, before he's sponsored by Asics, how hard was it to get decent shoes? Yeah, tough and expensive. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was, I mean, because... As a Paralympic athlete, we don't make a lot. Like, everyone is so amazed. I remember when I wasn't sponsored, I threw out this tweet about how I was annoyed um, about how I couldn't even get an ambassadorship for a running shoe company. And people were like, wait, you don't make $80,000 a year? I was like, what? Like, <laughs> I was like, is that, what? is that the base salary of an Olympian? Yeah, I don't know. I was like, you guys are surprised. I'm like, I don't even make half of that. Like, I don't know why you guys are so, so surprised. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was, it was really tough. And especially with spikes up in Canada, it's really yeah. tough to get 13s up there. And so it was a lot of times we'd have to ship it uh, from running warehouse to my parents' house and then either them ship it up or me smuggle it across the border <laughs> yeah that's right so uh, I mean, it's crazy. my son has got a size 13 foot and he's 15 i told him i said you better you just gotta stop <laughs> like yeah. you just won't have shoes but uh, uh it's gotta be a nightmare but now you're with asics like you said ben had to check to make sure you get a spike made yeah. for you <laughs> yes like uh, i'm guessing that you have the access to the full lineup super blast nova nova blast 4 all, all magic speed and meta speed in to answer Meg's question. What's your, what's your, like, what would you use for like daily training and that kind of stuff? Yeah. A bunch of my 
buddies mess with me because I love the Kai- the Kayano is the only shoe that I will easy run in. It is my go to. Um, and I remember I think you guys did a shoe a shoe review a couple of months on it, and you said it's actually cool now. I'm like, come on, it's always been cool. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's my go to shoe. Um, so yeah, that is for sure my favorite. I just love. I don't. I mean, I think someone. I mean, I get why people love the new um, carbon plated shoes. I totally get it. Um, but for me, like my job is to stay healthy. And so, um, yeah. I, I, I really like a s- stable shoe, especially with my injury, my, my right leg likes to pronate more than I would like it to. And so I feel like, uh, that's a shoe that really keeps me stable and keeps me up and running. Even I'll do long runs in that shoe, which a lot of the other A6 athletes are like, really, you do a long run? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's one I of mean, my it's favorite got enough shoes. cushioning for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is strange to me, though, uh, how many uh, pro athletes we've talked to that like stability shoes when they're and and I'm I'm not. It seems to be more the short distance um, runners or middle distance, I guess you would call it, uh, like the um, like stability shoes when they're just daily training. But like it, as soon as you go up to like marathon, it, it, they seem to the cushion starts yeah. like creeping in there. Yeah, absolutely. And then Noah Blast 3 was my go-to workout shoe. Um, I think the 4 is a little bit different. I mean, I don't, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure Slightly you guys different. have tried it. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, especially I would do even some of my 1500 meter work in that shoe. And so um, I feel like it's a little, the 4 is a little bit more spongy. Um, but I really like it for hills. The Noah Blast 4 is yeah. probably, yeah, that's my go-to shoe for hills. So I kind of, the 3 and 4, I kind of mix it. Um, now, um, but yeah, that's for sure my uh, go-to workout shoe. Um, and so those it's are such my an easy shoe. shoe to recommend too. Like I feel like that's a shoe. It's it's basic. You know, it, it it's gonna work for everybody. It's got enough cushioning for everybody. So I think it's such an easy shoe to recommend. Yeah, and then of course the speed the uh, the Man of Speed Sky. I uh, I do I'll do like road five k's and stuff in that. Um, I'll, every once in a while I'll do a I'll, I'll do a workout in them. Um, but just because I don't have like the same on, on my right side, like the muscle isn't the same as it is on the left. So um, sometimes uh, just it's a little hard on on my foot. Um, and so uh, I just I kind of more not 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 careful, but I, I think I am very in, in, in intentional when I when, when I want to use that shoe. And I'm always very like even I've used it plenty of times and I'm still surprised with how fast I run whenever I wear them. Like I, <laughs> we, we, we did a turkey trot this year and i was like oh like 15 50 yeah like that sounds that sounds great ended up running 15 20 and it was not a flat course um and i was mm. like oh wow yeah, like that's, that's amazing yeah i was like oh that's perfect i was like thank you i was like that makes me feel really good about my training right now are you gonna run any of the asics uh like road races like falmouth or cherry blossom or any of those they're not on the schedule currently but i certainly would love to um, especially, um, right. you better hurry up with cherry blossom. That's coming up. <laughs> yeah, no, probably that one probably won't, won't, won't happen. Um, I'm, uh, hopefully, uh, after the Paralympics, um, or oh, you got to the lead up after the fine. Summer. Yeah. So I think um, Falmouth is right around the Olympics. You probably can't do both. I think it's right after. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Or, yeah. It probably, right it'll be like right before the Paralympics. I'm sure that's, that's, yeah. That that's that's usually how they how, how they wind up. But in 2025, I'm definitely gonna try and do more road races because I just really love them. Um, like I only like the 1500 and the 800 on the track. 3K, 5K just it just sounds horrible to me. And I am running a 3K oh, just in going around February. Oh, yeah. it's just I just I'm like it hurts for way too long. Uh, like the, the 3K, <laughs> like like See, like 3K pace, like it hurts from the gun. Like I I am uh, not a fan. Yeah, I'm more afraid of like the 5K. Like I'll run, if you said you, you have a choice between a 50 K and a 5 K <laughs> and I was like, I'd probably go 50 K just cause like the 5 K they can hurt and they hurt for a long time. But, um, uh, that's interesting cause Falmouth is one of our favorite races. Um, so if you get a chance, I, obviously this year probably wouldn't work out with, with your schedule, but definitely get on that, that event for, with a six. Yeah. 2025. No, it would be awesome. And I think ASICs, like last year, sponsored some track events up in New York, too. So I'm going to try and see if I can swindle my way into one of those, um, too. And see Just if I can it all. Yeah, go and sit on the back of a fast uh, 1500 pack and, yeah, see if we can do, do a little something. So, yeah. I Speaking of uh, tracks, like, it, are, is it 
I'm guessing it's 200 meters and 400 meters tracks. Do you have a preference for uh, size of the track? Yeah, I feel like 400. I definitely like outdoors, not a huge indoor person, especially with the person who has size, th- size 13 feet. I'm not super tall, but I have a pretty <laughs> long stride. Um, so I'm not, yeah, I don't really like the too close um, yeah, for sure. Away. Yes, yeah, yeah, not a fan. Um, so yeah, I like the, yeah, that long hundred meters to go. Um, I feel like it, I mean, I think it's great to run indoors because the strategy is so different and so much harder in my opinion. Um, so I think it really preps you for, uh, outdoors for sure. But, um, but yeah, I, I certainly like the outdoor track a lot better. See, if you, if you were not as good, you could throw the strategy thing out the window and just try to run it as hard as you can. Then, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, that's, I, I get gassed on the track cause I have no idea uh, what the pace is. So you just, uh, just go run as hard as you can for as long as you can. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, can I can um, I put that question back on you guys, or do we have enough time? I'd love to hear what some of your yeah, yeah, yeah. shoes are, if you don't mind. From uh, from a- Asics, I love the Super Blast. Yeah, we're both huge Super Super Blast fans. Yeah. Just Although the, I really do like the Nova Blast Four. That's a good one. I do. Okay. But if if they were both in front of me and I could choose one and Super had Blast. to choose one, I'd have to go Super Blast. I ran the Tokyo Marathon the Super Blast, so I think the range of versatility for it. That you could run a 5K, you could run a easy runs, and you can also, if you wanted to try to pick it up or run a little faster, you, you can do it in the Super Blast. I think that it just has like a wide range of, of uses. So that's why I'd probably give it the edge. No, no, I agree with you. That, that, that was the first shoe they ever sent me. Um, and, uh, and it lasted a lot longer than I thought it would. I mean, I went for running it the other day. So um, yeah. I've, I've had that shoe for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited for version two. I think we get that later this year. Yeah, I think uh, February. Yeah. So awesome. yeah, it won't be too long after this comes out. Yeah. No, I, I feel like I'm always waiting for you guys to shoe 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 reviews, and I'm always like, all right, all right, now I want that shoe. Okay, perfect. Let's. Yeah, <laughs> but now I you're, want the you shoe can. now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny when we talk to pro athletes. There's two different kinds. There's the kind that are like. They'll run whatever you put on their feet. They're just like, ah, I don't, you know, whatever. I, they don't know, like they don't, they wouldn't know stack. They wouldn't know like meshes. They wouldn't know in rubber. And then you have other athletes. I, Emma's probably more particular. And, uh, you know, she knows all the like details of the shoe and knows all the stuff. So it is interesting to find that like while the shoes do make a difference and certainly for me, psychologically, it makes a difference what shoe I'm wearing when I go out the door. But uh, I think there's some athletes and some people that are just like, yeah, whatever, I can run in anything. And that, but that is so bizarre to me. No, I am, I am so picky, especially like I have a huge, long uh, uh, injury prevention program. And so like if, if I feel like the shoe is hurting that, like I'm – Anything? I, yeah, I'm like, uh-uh. So yeah, that's why like yeah. Kayano is so perfect. It, is, it <laughs> leads me to the promised land, so yeah. I'm, I'm very happy about it. <laughs> uh, they'll be happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we actually got to meet Kayana-san uh, this past summer. He oh, came. He came to our head, headquarters here, and we took him took him out for pizza and beer. So, <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty good. So meet. jealous. So jealous. Yeah. Well, I mean, you just tell Mac you want to come to the HQ. I'm sure he'll let you. Yeah. Anytime yeah, that's you want. Right. That's right. <laughs> we, should, we should do. Yeah. Next time we do this interview, it should be in person. We'll make Mac yeah. send you here. Oh, for sure. Sounds great to me. <laughs> Um, okay, Nate, this was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us. And it was, it was cool to learn a little bit more about the Paralympics because I definitely did not fully understand all of the categories and how it works. So I appreciate you explaining all of that as well. Well, just some exposure to it. Yeah. I mean, I don't think a lot of people are following it the way that they're following the, you know, Olympics. So, you know, it is interesting to see that there is this uh, whole nother set of athletes that we can cheer for. So that's pretty awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. All right, cool. All right. And good luck in Paris. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hopefully I see you guys before then. (laughs) 